Okay, so what I, uh, what I want to do about this history is show you um, what the home life, through what the home life was like and what we were always discussing, how it's related directly to the philosophy of this work and how we actually, uh, how this work is in action. So there's, when I was thinking about this, I realized the pieces that, that, are, that are parallel to the practice. So Moshe was very scientifically oriented, but also very interested in alternative methods, right? In Eastern thinking, in Eastern philosophy, in mystical things like Rojif, and you know all of his uh, philosoph philosophies in, in, in the Hindu philosophies, but he was also very grounded. And this is something that I find is always a very important balance in our work because it kind of sometimes looks like magic and nobody understands how it works, but everything has to be very simple. And my focus, as you know, has always been to keep it, everything has to make sense. So this was a constant, theme in the house, right? Nobody at the time had yoga in their life in the, in the West or martial arts. Like this was something that we had because of Moshe's background. And then my parents developed this real interest. And I was given these really mystical things to read when I was little, but I mean, we'd always have these huge meals where we'd sit and talk around the table for hours. And I have that table I can show you. Uh, it's, I still have it. Um, huge dining table, Moshe liked to eat and, um, and, and talk. And so we all talked. So there'd be something like spirits. He was really, he, we, my brother and I, our family were supposed to be the living proof of his theories and how they work and he didn't want us to turn out wrong. So from the time I was really little, he didn't want my body to behave badly. So, you know, he didn't allow me to do ballet. He wanted me to do other kinds of dance. He wanted me to do judo. He'd take me to Alexandria and I and show people how feet should look because people didn't differentiate, you know, like we do all these things, all these stories that I tell about the foot being one unit in a shoe and how we, show all the toes and how that develops areas in the brain, he'd pick up my feet and show them. And I just want to say, Alexander and I, you have to understand, it was like this big basement hall in the street called Alexander and I. There were mats on the floor. I remembered it when I was thinking of this. They were made of straw. And sometimes like bits of straw would come off almost like splinters, like it was really not very comfortable. And he'd have a whole range of people there from dancers, to people with uh, disabilities. And he'd, he'd sit, there was a little stage there. He'd put me next to him on the stage and he'd, uh, he'd give this class to these people, always to whoever was there. So if it was a dancer who was trying too hard to look elegant, he'd get on her case, tell her she's not feeling what she's doing, but just doing it for appearances. I mean, so all that he was into excellence in movement, he also wanted to show me that it shouldn't be fake. And in the same way that we would sit and talk about um, what a, a big conversation topic that came up a lot is what is awareness? Does a dog have awareness? Does a flower have awareness? If a person has awareness, what is it, right? So in a way that's very philosophical, but in a way he didn't want us to go too out there because we had a friend who was a medium and he really lay into her like, spirits so where are the spirits and when when i mean he'd get very bored he'd go so when does the spirit decide to go into the body is it so so spirits are standing up there in the sky that's what moshe says right spirits are standing up there in the sky waiting like they're like runners on on in a you know on a track and they're waiting for two people to you know to have sex <laughs> and then do they just wait? As soon as this thing happens, they're going to rush in and have a competition. Who's going to get the, into the spirit that it's going to be a person? I mean, how? Do, what are they talking about? Like, when is where is the spirit? When is the spirit? Where are they? He and he'd go into a whole tangent and a rant about spirits and what they look like, and are they fighting? And do the girls win or the boys win? So, this is the kind of conversations we had around the table. And I sent you these songs, right? These French songs that you saw. 
And I, we can play them at some point. It, so they're a bit bawdy, but they're very grounded and they're funny. And that's really the kind of conversations we have. So he'd come and, and he'd usually come with a lot, a lot of friends. Uh, so one, one of his best friends, and maybe his very best friend, was the sort of classical actor. He was the Lawrence Olivier of, of Israel, of the Hebrew. He was called Aaron Meskin. And he had two children. One of them was my age. His wife was an artist. So basically pretty bohemian people. And I think that really threw him back. You know, Moshe was in Paris in the 20s and 30s. In when Paris was really the center of all this alternative art, you know, all these impressionists and all the avant-garde art really more, even like, uh, you know, Picasso and then, uh, um, you know, the, the, the very revolutionary modern artists. And so he had that bohemian side, which I kind of go, okay, you know, where does it go on that scale towards the spirits? <laughs> and on the other hand, he had this very grounded side, which was the physics and the math and the, in the work you see, this always referring to the ground. And so in that same way, he talked to us about the philosophies of the East and Gandhi and Judo and the whole idea of going with the movement and going through it. And, you know, and all these philosophical ideas, but he didn't want us to go too far out there. And I'm talking about the children, right? So he'd still do my math homework and, um, you know, sit with me and make me really grounded. And then next thing he'd go, and make a whole big show about how schools are so terrible and the teachers don't know what they do and they stand up and they just give their lecture and they don't know what effect it's having and it's just boring and he'd stand there and mimic them. He'd go, you know, just imitate a really boring lecturer and mock the teachers. So in a way, you know, am I supposed to re respect them or not? So there was always this thing about question everything. And as you know, this is a system of questions. This whole work is a system of questions. And that's why all these sort of controversial balancing discussions were constant, but constant. I mean, that's all, they came over and over again and you'd have to think for yourself. So even if he'd do my science work with me or my math homework with me, he'd go, just because they gave you this particular formula, why are you accepting it? Like, how do you know it really works? So they're just making you think it because that's the way they're constructing it. So let's go back and think about the person who first discovered it. How did they figure this out? So he'd like reverse it for me and just teach me to always question with respect, right? So it was, everything was part of life. The, the songs that I played, for, that I sent you, they're a comment, a very strong social comment. They break the conventions, right? They're kind of unconventional. It's not like classical music. He's making fun of things, but he's also showing human nature. So he would attack the establishment in a way. Um, this particular singer had a lot of songs that were very poignant about social injustice. Um, Moshe did, and you know, even at the end of his life, he was even more so very aggressive about attacking conventions. Uh, you know, the idea of posture, for example, he goes, what's posture? But it's not about posture, it's for posts, it's not for people. You've heard that lecture, right? There isn't such a thing. It depends what you want to do. So everything was always on that experimental point. So we'd go, okay, so how does this work? We take, there was a game, we play these games, right? So I think I showed you, you take a piece of paper and we take newspapers actually and tear it in three places like that, you know? And then, and we do this a lot. You have to stand and pull so that it's equal so that the middle piece falls away like that. But it's really difficult because usually even with a newspaper, one side will come away unless 
you're really centered and you can pull at exactly the same speed at exactly the same force. So it was a game of skill and it was fun and it was crazy. There'd be pieces of paper all over the newspaper, all over the floor. But then in order to go, okay, so why is this hand doing it this way and this hand doing it this way? Lie on the, on the coffee table. Let's see what happens when you're lying down and just right there on the coffee table or let's try this in the garden and do some judo there so that we can see is one side the same as the other side. So everything blended into this idea of a system of questions, testing, thinking for yourself and an ongoing experimentation. So even if you found out one answer one time, can you refine the answer for another time? So these skills went on to lots of things. He had another game, which was you take a box of matches. <laughs> Have you seen this? I, got, I still can't do it. And he'd, so here's, here's a box of matches. And he always had matches because he was always smoking cigarettes, right? Um, and, and with his thumb, he'd push it so that you have to make it so that the fire comes out and flies across the room, right? So all over the living room, we had a parquet floor. I don't want to burn my carpet. All over the floor, this parquet floor, these matches would go flying and we'd have to learn how to do it. Everything we did with the right hand, he, wait, I don't want to burn my carpet. Everything we did with the right hand, we'd have to do with the left hand. He wanted me to be ambidextrous and I can do a lot of things with both sides. And in judo also, I practiced my best technique that, you know, everybody has their favorite, also my hair, everybody has their favorite moves. So to practice them on both sides, just always talking about developing the brain, even before we had all these fMRIs. So th this was completely dynamic. So he'd come to us with these friends who are these artists. And also the, his other really good friend was the daughter of the, uh, the president. Eshkol, we had a, a, a president called Eshkol. So apart from David Ben-Gurion, there was also the, who was the prime minister, we had a prayer, we still have presidents. And his daughter is an artist and also invented a movement notation system. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she notated a lot of his exercises and she taught them. So she used to come and she was a very unconventional person like she really didn't care about any conventions not in the way she dressed not in the way she spoke she was just didn't revere anything everything was questioned so um that's the one thing apart from so as well as mocking school teachers um there was also the thing about the medical institutions and the doctors that are so blinkered and don't ask questions and just go by what was and in the same way, I mean, going on the same plane, he had this thing about manners. He goes, look, I come to you every day, so I don't need to be polite all the time. I'm just going to, as soon as I walk in the door, I'm going to say all the polite words. Hello, goodbye, thank you, excuse me, how do you do, may I, you know, all the words, and then I don't have to say them again. So he'd walk in the door, just just thinking outside the box all the time. Um, the, oh, we had another skill game, which was catching flies. So we'd sit outside and, you know, there's a real skill to catching flies with your hands. Have you tried it? Because they go up. So, but if you come from the side, they feel the wind, the, you know, the air being pushed. So they, they fly away. So, I mean, we just sit there trying to catch flies with both hands. Um, so again, uh, this element of fun and games and how it meshed into the philosophy. So these elements of the philosophy, the looking for the balance between what we can envision and strive for and how to be really grounded, the asking questions, and the fun element, which Mia always talks about, and the curiosity all the time of what's what. So it, again, like, does a dog have awareness? How do we know? Like, what what defines awareness, right? Um, and and together with that, always looking for these movements where the impossible becomes possible. How come? When I want to lift my foot up to my head, actually it helps when I go to the side a lot. 
How does that work? So I, I've defined that, right? In saying this coming from another direction and the ribs get soft, so it doesn't matter, then you can do it to all directions. But I can see how that really influenced my mission of taking these things that are so extraordinary and, and, and forward thinking and grounding them. You know, he, he then wrote this book, The Elusive Obvious, which everybody's like erased Coleman Corentire out of the literature. But Coleman was a really good friend of his. He was, he was instrumental in bringing him to America. So it wasn't just Tom Hanna. It was also Coleman. And Coleman was a, a, a lovely guy and spent a lot of time with Moshe. And, uh, and they, he helped him a lot to write that book. But the words, the elusive obvious, I think explain this work a lot, right? Because people are looking and you heard what... Uh, we were talking about the other day about how it applies to these football teams and all this complicated stuff, but it's really very simple. So that if you wanted to um, pause the recording and tell me if you have any questions or you want me to explain. Okay, so the household was very diverse. Um, Israel was a very young country. It was established uh, just a few years before I was born. And Moshe came uh, just a few years before that. Uh, so it was very young, a very young country. Uh, and we lived in an area right on the, on the beach, on the sea, which had a lot of diplomats. Um, so, and because I come from a family that's partly British, partly South African, partly Israeli, um, there were, our family was kind of anglicized in a way, and there were a lot of, uh, because of all the diplomats that lived in the area, they used to come and go from our house a lot. My parents had a lot of parties, they had a huge garden, we had a cook, and um, so it, already it was very diverse. Also, when there were actors or scientists or um, you know, any kind of visitors from abroad, there was one really big hotel. That's all there was, it was our house. Afterwards, the American ambassador built next to us about 10 years later, but it was our house and a big fancy English kind of hotel that was actually um, built by my, one of my grandfathers. Um, so we were very, we'd go there a lot to the hotel. So also orchestras that would come, you know, musicians. Afterwards, the musicians that would come from America would stay with the American ambassador, like the menuins, that's how we got involved with them. Um, so it was, it was a very mixed um, community in our house. And then when Moshe came, he'd bring all these people who'd come to him for lessons, you know. So not only this, uh, these actors' family, he was called this Mexican family, and all these artists that came, but also sort of visiting scholars and people like that. And then my own grandparents, my mother's um, parents, uh, were, were very interesting people, you know, um, linguists and things like that. So there were always very dynamic conversations going on. It was very lively. We as children, it was a very free household, very happy and very free. Um, so we'd play outside in the mud, run in, and there's Moshe lying on the floor. You know, he'd just take these naps. He could just lie on the floor. And then two minutes later, he's snoring. You could hear it next door. I mean, it was just crazy. He'd lie there with his, you know, like a whale with his belly. And we'd just step over him with the mud. And he didn't care. Um, or he'd grab us and try something, or he'd do that. I just thought of something, let's try this. So it was just all very happening all the time. Very carefree, very um, just open door. So that, that was, and, and also these influences like the first yogi that came to Israel, came to our house because of Moshe. And the orchestras also, they used to, you know, play chamber music in our house, London Symphony Orchestra. We got really friendly with them. We afterwards actually um, uh, spent time with them in Japan. They were there when we were there. So there was a lot of, of music and a lot of discussions mostly uh, about 
all these different theories and also the controversial things. Um, you know, we had some friends who were doctors who were so disgusted with all of Moshe's ideas that there'd, there'd be big fights there. Um, so, and I was told, so Tom asked, um, the first time Moshe came to our house, I was about two, just under two, and he was resting in the garden in a lounge chair. And I apparently, I was playing with water and I took the hose and I sprayed him up and down and down and up. Me, I can tell you, because I'm really small, I don't remember, but that's what I've always been told. And I think there might be a photograph. Um, so that was our introduction, but he forgave me. <laughs> so yeah, anything else? Let me think what else I can say to give you this atmosphere of these games. And you know, we continued them when we went to Japan because the Japanese are really big into games. We had a game in Japan where you take a, a piece of silk or something, you put it in your hand like that, you have it hang over. And in turns, everybody has to grab it from each other, but before the other one closes his hand. So a lot of these skill games, you know, we didn't watch TV or do stuff. We just played all the time. And you can see how much that influenced the way this work is. So always looking for the balance between the playful and sort of light and being centered and internalized. And also always looking for something new or a new way to discover what you can do, which I think if there's one thing I would say about the system, somebody asked my mother the other day, if you had to tell practitioners one thing about this work, what would you say? So what I would say is, remember it's a system of questions. You're not fixing, you can't, if you keep on asking the right questions, right? So we define the right questions and all of that, but also when we teach how to put the hand, it's not to fix or even to feel, it's to pick up information, it's to ask a question. It's always about that. The method wasn't formed. Somebody asked us the other day, so when Moshe was there, did you just all lie on the ground and do ATMs? And it's like, what? <laughs> Never, I mean, it wasn't even conceivable that anybody would have the patience to lie on the floor for more than five minutes. But you try one thing and go, wow, does that work or does that work? And then when my um, brother grew up and he was really into basketball and he got friendly with the national team, they were then the European champions, actually. They used to come and he constructed things for them. One of them got injured and he did a lesson for him, leaning, oops, leaning on the wall, um, you know, in the living room. It was just very uh, dynamic and very organic. And just try to imagine that in the whole world, there were only two practitioners, Moshe and Mia. So nobody knew what it was. <laughs> so he'd have these interviews on the radio where he'd be just confronting everybody. I, I think you heard it. I, I remember this one interview where they said to him, so if you're so into, into health, how come you're not a vegetarian? Did you hear this interview? And he said, why would I be a vegetarian? Are you a vegetarian? Like, do you want to be like a cow that eats grass all day and is just fat? Or do you want to be like a lion that eats meat and can run? You know, I don't want to be a cow. <laughs> I want to be. And then I go to school the next day and we're sitting there in class and the teacher goes, I heard that interview yesterday. You know, why did he say that? It's such bad influence. And I'm like, Okay, uh, he had another thing. Um, I'll remember. I mean, there were certain certain conventions and questions that uh, people asked him. I mean, you know, he smoked so much. Now we know much more about how bad cigarettes are. So I'm sorry that he smoked so much, but he used to go, you know, one cigarette into the next one all the time. And uh, he used to say, that's okay, I'm going to get cancer. And then I'm going to, with the next cigarette, I'm going to give my cancer cancer and I'll be okay. That's why I'm smoking so much. That's what he'd say. 
this just arguing about everything. And then, you know, he started learning to swim when he was much older, right? You heard that. He was about 70 or something. He decided he wanted to swim. He and my mom would explore. So first they went to try specific eye exercises. They went to this woman and they were doing all this weird stuff. And we all had to do it, like stand with the sun and turn the head and notice where the eyes are going. I mean, we'd all stand, the whole family doing this crazy stuff. Then he had this thing about why are we moving all of our other muscles, but not our facial muscles. So he had this thing where he'd just sit there in the middle and he'd go, you know, every kind of face <laughs> in the middle. I mean, there's people sitting there having coffee and he'd start making all this facial stuff, trying to figure out how many combinations he can do. And then when he was 70, he decided he has to learn to swim. So he took lessons. He'd lie there, really looked like a whale. He'd lie on his back and his belly was out there. And he wanted us to come and see how he swims. So we'd go and see him learning to swim. Always new stuff. It was just, um, you know, figuring things out all the time. He had a lot of curiosity. So that's why I'm saying it's a system of questions. Everything was curiosity. And we, we all did it. Like my grandparents um, used to do some of, of the exercises from, you know, that, that they learned from him. Um, just like I do them every morning a little bit, you know, just to feel where's my middle. Uh, you know, I do a lot of stretching. So what else do you think will be interesting for people? Yeah, because I think that that's fun. <laughs> it was very irritating to be in that house because Moshe never stopped talking and trying things and experimenting. And it was just, he was so always into his interests and which were, you know, really interesting things. But I was a little girl, so they put me to bed at six or seven and Moshe is talking. I get up in the morning. He's still talking. Like, I, I don't know how this was. He just never, so I, I didn't really, it's not like I learned something from them. Like, can you pinpoint from your parents? Like one thing that was interesting. It was just there all the time. It was too much kind of, I mean, even into my teens, I remember when we got back from Japan. So I was already a black belt and I was working in the Maccabi games. You know, we did judo from a very young age. In fact, we had the first dojo in Israel. We imported tatami from Japan and then we could do judo there, which was also kind of out there. Um, weird, you know, at the time. Um, but I, so I was coming back from the Maccabi games. I was working uh, with the teams there and it was Saturday. So some crazy fanatic um, religious guy, you know, they don't want us to drive on, on Saturday. You're not allowed to drive with the religious uh, Jewish people. He just, there were a few people standing. And when I was at the traffic light, he ran and kicked my car and bent my door. And then people had to haul him away. And I came home and I, and Moshe was there, of course. And I was like, oh my God, you know what happened to me? I was driving and this religious guy kicked the door of the car and mom and dad, I'm really sorry, but, and Moshe was like, you should know better. You're a judo car. You should have got out of the car and kicked him in a place where he can never have children again. <laughs> Not make more of him. You know, it was like, I, I, I always had to live up. Like I let him down because I didn't, you know, I didn't do the, the very bravest thing. It was really interesting having to always, we were like the living proof of his ideas and methods. So it was, he had a vested interest in us turning out, you know, capable and, and you know, uh, embodying the work um, and the way that, you know, they wanted it in the schools. Because when I was a, a little girl, is when he and Ben Gurion and the, some scientists in the Weizmann Institute got together and you saw the letter where they wanted it to be in the school system in order to establish a generation of people who could really um, uh, do something good in the world, you know, just, just 
what I'm trying to do, you know, just bring a lot more awareness and self critical thinking and abilities, as we know that this work can give people. But there was a very strong opposition party in the country at the time, and he, they didn't, they, they, could, they couldn't pass it in the uh, government. But I used to go with my mother. And I mean, I'd say if this one interesting thing that I, I do in, cherish is the thought of going with her to Ben Gurion. I, actually, I also remember going with her to his house and his mother, his mother was a character. And of course we knew the mother and the brother and everyone. But I remember going with her to Ben Gurion and um, he, was, he was a lot like my grandfather. They were both small people and just so humble um, and dedicated to their work. I, Mia has told the story and you might have heard it, but there'd be people, people knew she would go every day. So they knew her car, people, you know, in the street. And so the groups of people would congregate. Israel, Tel Aviv is built uh, along, you know, the, people, the immigrants came from Germany. So it's very Bauhaus, Tel Aviv. And so there's um, like uh, gardens in the middle of both sides of the streets in a lot of the, the older um, sort of buildings. It was interesting, they came from Germany and built, built these Bauhaus big blocks in the Mediterranean. But anyway, it's, it's interesting. Uh, anyway, he lived in one of those, Ben Gurion. Now it's called Ben Gurion Street. And there's this, this row of, of trees and you know benches like in Paris and in Berlin. Um, so they congregate there because they wanted, he'd wait for my mother and he'd stand in the window to look out for her. And so they knew when he, she's coming and they wanted to see his face. So they'd be standing there. And when he'd come out, they'd all, when he, they'd see his face, they'd all clap. He was really revered, especially after they, they brought a lot of people from Yemen. From Yemen. Um, it was called the, um, the Eagles flights. They brought them on planes. They thought they were big eagles. They brought them to Israel. Anyway, they really revered him. So anyway, I'd go in there and there were all his security and all of that. At the beginning when my mother worked with him, the security guard would stand there the whole time to make sure she didn't break his neck. But eventually they became very good friends and, and my mother, uh, I mean, we knew their families and so on. So we'd go by these guards and go upstairs to his huge desk and a huge, well, I was little, it looked like an enormous Persian, red Persian carpet. And as soon as he saw my mother, even if he was writing, he'd stand up and say, I'm here, <laughs> I'm here for you. Um, but he had a lot of pictures of him talking to school children and he took me to see them. And he said, look, you're from all these children, you're the only one who's growing up with this work you'll have to take it to the children because you understand that it's 65 years old. Um, but he was just so lovely. And so she'd work with him. And then when we'd leave, he'd stand in the window to wave and these people would be clapping again, right? So one day when we came, he said, what are all these people clapping in the street for? He is the prime minister, right? And my mother said, for you. They were waiting to see you and they're so, they admire you. So they clapped for you. He, he looked at us and he said, for me? <laughs> it was like, what a generation of leaders we had that were just so selfless and so humble. So that these are my memories of him that I, I really cherish um, and influenced me as you see. Because Moshe, you know, the thing is with Moshe, I saw all the sides of him and also the mistakes he made and also the annoying things he did. And it was more like with your parents, you can be really critical. And I think that's been good for the work because I'm not afraid to question some of the stuff he's done. Um, you know, I don't accept it like a, he's a guru or a God, but Ben Gurion was a bit different, <laughs> you know, in that way. So anyway, that's one memory. Wow. So the, 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 
real dichotomy between the questioning and doing unconventional things and not wanting to listen to authority and, and breaking rules, but staying very grounded and respectful to tradition and to science. So the thing about tradition, for example, I told you about these actors that he was like the Laurence Olivier, you know, he was like the Shakespearean actor in Israel. So in fact, there was a lot of real culture, real history, real respect for real art. And, and, um, and I even remember, and, and tradition, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, and, and what, mocking school teachers, but being very sure that we couldn't, you know, we're very focused on our education that we understood. And he worked on our homework with us and was pushing us to go for higher education. So to find that balance, you know, when you think about what's going now politically, like in this country, where we had four years of leadership that threw every single decency out, you know, there was like no rules. Here, there was a real search for keeping on the straight and narrow while still respecting and respecting it and still questioning respectfully, which is what we do with the work, right? We don't just go, oh, you know, it's all about, it's all hocus pocus and spirits and we can't explain it. But on the other hand, what we're doing is pretty amazing. So let's, ex let's get grounded with it. The, the results are so effective. How does this work? And, and, and you know, it's, at the beginning, we didn't know how it works. Like now I can explain it in words. I don't think you ever heard Moshe or Mia explain it in words in the way that we have it written now, right? We have it all even almost like a spreadsheet where we put the principle with the in-between with the, you know, the real idea of, of, of how it affects your thoughts. And now we also know how it works in the brain and which part of the brain is accessed when you look up and which part of access. So I, I have the tools that were not available then. So, but there it was really like, he used to tell me that there were stem cells in the brain when still the belief was that you're born, when I was little, the belief was that you're born with a certain number of brain cells and they slowly die off. That's why older people can't remember and so on and so forth. Now we know that's not true. The brain has regenerative cells, just like the bones have bone marrow. And you're always creating new, new cells for your neurons to connect. And he told me this when I was six and seven, but he couldn't prove it. When I went to Stanford and I, you know, 20 years later, they were like, oh, wow, just discovered this plasticity of the brain. And I'm like, I, I was told this, you know, 20 years ago, it was just such a bizarre situation to be in, but I was so used to being in a position where I was the odd one out. I mean, in many ways, right? I mean, what was going on in the house was extraordinary and wonderful, but also made us different. And that part was really not very nice. Like I said, the school, children, school teachers didn't like it. The children, we were different. And then we went to Japan and we were definitely different there. There were no foreigners in Japan at the time. We were, people would sit in the underground and look in my eyes because they're green, right? And the kids would just go. <laughs> Everybody had black hair then, you know, they didn't have all this different colors hair that they put now. And it was just... We would, I, I'd stand in the, in, in judo, we'd do hours of judo a day, right? Five hours. And I'd see, so it would be dark outside. So I could see myself in the windows. So all these really lovely black haired, shiny black haired people. And then there's me standing like white and tall and oversized. And it was just different all the time. Um, so, you know, that part wasn't easy, but well, you know, it is what it is. You get out of it. Um, yeah, so I was going to say also his respect for tradition. So um, he used to come, you know, uh, Passover is a big holiday in, in uh, Israel, and we always had this huge Passover. My grandfather was a very 
important scholar of the language and of the Bible. He was uh, the legal draftsman for the country. He knew all the laws of the Turkish laws, the British mandate laws, all the laws of the Bible he could quote. He was kind of a genius with that. And that's why he became the legal draftsman, wrote all the laws for the country, and was also on two committees, one for the language, because Hebrew is a biblical language, but we have modern words like motor car and telephone and like, what do you do with them? Um, and also he was on a committee for the Judiciary Committee uh, to make all the laws. So here's Juliana, please, I'll just let him in. So, um, so it, uh, in the Passover, um, we were sitting on a, in this huge table, I remember, and my grandfather was running it. He was also older than Moshe, but Moshe didn't know because my grandfather was in really good condition. Hi, Juliano. And so um, he was conducting this ceremony or this story. It's a long, long, um, long story there. Uh, and Moshe kept on interrupting, which was really annoying. And at the end of it, somehow, I don't know what happened, but he suddenly came to my mother and he said, Moshe did, he said, I feel so bad that I interrupted your father. You know, I actually never realized he's older than me. If I had known that before we started this ceremony, I would have never interrupted. So that was really interesting because with all that he would interfere and question and thwart conventions, these kind of things really stuck with him. And I think that this respect also for the acting, right, of this very classic acting of his best friend, and also the, the respect for, in the martial arts, respect for teachers and respect for elders. And then on the other side, this complete mockery of the medical profession, of the teachers, of any conventionality that we could bring from school, he would make us question. And I, I think finding that balance, I think within this work, this is another search for the balance, is looking inside yourself, which is a very spiritual thing, and yet always being grounded. You always feel the ground again, feel the chair again, um, and ask questions, but ask the right questions, right? That's why I always say they have to be simple because you can go out and say, you know, all kinds of different things that take you in many directions, but I, I make sure, and, and I think these are the things that we now specified in, our, in my generation, right? So, Moshe was all over the place because he was trying everything and also he didn't have all the facility of modern technology and sciences. As you see, he had a lot of foresight and the, the, the idea that he even had about regenerative cells in the brain was, he just imagined it. He didn't see it on the MRIs like I did. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of genius there and forethought and the courage to have that foresight because he had that conviction, even though he didn't have the proof, he knew it. And that's, that's amazing. Um, but, you know, so, so we, it was always thinking outside the box, but always bringing it back to the center. And that's, that's why also the judo, I know that some people teach judo with this work, but they teach the movements as ATMs. And that's not the point. The point of the judo part is is the center. That's why, you know, the movements that Mia does now that are so small, it doesn't matter. It's like, how many places can you move around so that you can find your center again? And then the philosophies, right, of going with the movement to come out the other side. When you fall, it's about getting up again. So it's, it's also an analogy to life. And that's why a lot of, a lot of the the reason of doing it on the floor. And that's why we didn't have beds in, in all these. I mean, most of the time, and you see Mia still works on the floor is because as we know, first of all, in practical ways, as people get older, they're so scared of falling and that's when they break their hip, right? They're really so stiff. But on the other hand, it's also, we, we see it as 
It's always there. It's your support. It's your teacher. And the reason the floor is there is to help you get up again. So all these things, I mean, we learned to do judo rolls, jumps and rolls before we learned a lot of other techniques. He really wanted to bring in the concepts that he then used for his work as underlying foundations. And I know that he thought that if he gets enough people to do his exercises over and over again, it will just change consciousness, change collective consciousness because of the things that we now define when we talk about learning from differences, which we then generalize to appreciating differences, not only within ourselves, but with, between each other, right? When we learn about distribution of work, which I just keep on hammering in, that's what he thought will permeate society. But you know, the world has changed people. And as I always said, people need to make it more explicit. People need to have it defined for them. It didn't happen by itself. So just doing more and more and more ATMs does not work. Um, as you know, we've got a different focus here. We work around the principles, we work around the, the questioning and the simplicity of the questioning. And that really was the essence of what was going on at home as I described to you before, all the time on the living room table, in the dining room table, on the dining room table, playing with the matches, playing with the papers, catching flies. You know, it's all the same thing. Like how much are you aware of yourself that you can, you know, catch the fly <laughs> and not breathe on it or do the same thing with both sides? What makes the difference? Why is it even important? You know, how is it connected to gravity? because he showed us that to get it really right, you've got to do it while lowering your center of gravity. You've got to bend a little bit in your knees to get the whole center um, equal. It's very tricky. Um, so all these games were actually the philosophy and all the movements that we do, the ATM sequences, they are the philosophy. That's why we keep on saying, it's not about the movement, it's what you learn through it. So it's not just a game of skill, you really have to think. And then if you know how to do it on your right, can you do the exact same thing on the left? Oh yeah, he got very interested at some point. So he and me, I would go on these ventures. So they had this eye teacher, then they had a voice teacher. They decided to learn how to sing. And you should have heard these high notes and low notes in the house and all kinds of things. Everything that they learned so is like, they practice it all the time. So always looking for new, new angles of human capacity and what it takes to learn certain skills and to know about yourself. So it's the same, you know, one hand versus the other versus the feet, your middle, rolling versus standing. That was the, the root of the work and what he was searching for. And always again, so does a dog have awareness? You know, where are the spirits? I don't see them. Don't talk to me about it, you know? <laughs> okay. So how, how that okay, so the, the thing of being different was challenging. Um, it was challenging from a couple of points of view. Um, also Israel, as I said, was very young and a very conformist society in a way. Everybody had to be the same and live in a kibbutz or something like that. And we lived in a house in the middle of where all the diplomats were. So already, and I was bilingual and had a lot of British influence. I mean, the teachers would call my mother to school to complain that I say please and thank you. Because in Israel, it's like, why waste your time on manners? We have to survive. <laughs> so, so already that was a problem. And then there was this thing with Moshe going on these interviews and saying that, you know, do you want to be a vegetarian and eat grass like a cow? Or do you want to be like a lion? Oh, he had this other thing about what's all this thing when jogging started? He goes, why do you, why do you need to jog? I mean, no, all these people that jog are just making themselves sick. A lion doesn't jog just so that he'd be able to catch the antelope. <laughs> he rests until he needs it. 
So he had all these controversial things and then I'd go to school and they'd go, we heard this on the radio. We know he's in your house. Like, why does he say this? So I, it, it wasn't easy. So then when I was, what, another thing, so then I went to Japan. I was, as I said, even more different, right? Because all the Japanese. But eventually, first of all, we came to Japan. We went straight to the judo school. They did, my, my parents didn't take us to school, school. First of all, straight away Kodokan. So, cause that's where judo was started. And um, so we started practicing there and eventually, I, I mean, I was like, I want to go to school. So I, I actually went to an international school, which was a sacred heart and all the teachers were nuns. And I was the only Jewish girl there. So that was, it was different again. But the te- the, these nuns were really nice. They wanted to learn Hebrew. I used to read them Hebrew in mass. It was an interesting situation. But there I actually could make a lot of friends because all the girls there, there were girls from, it was only girls from 45 countries. So everybody was different and everybody had traveled. And so they were less cliquey. And I, I still have friends from there. Then I came back, back to Israel and I was the only black belt of my age in the whole of Europe, right? So that was really weird because I come back, I still had one more year of high school and I was used to real masters. I mean, we had, a, the, you know, I, I just got to really respect real masters, people that, that were very humble in the theater, in the judo, in the flower arrangement, in koto, in all kinds of things, it was very respectful come to Israel, it's chaos. The kids are screaming in the class, the teachers throwing pieces of chalk at them. I mean, it was just crazy. So yeah, it was really difficult um, until I I came to, to America to college and then I started feeling a little more normal. Um, so it, look at me now. I mean, I go in, I walk with, I have a lot of friends I go for walks and they tell me that their back really hurts and I see them like this walking and they've got a knee brace over here and the other one had a surgery on her back the other day. I can't say anything, you know, but I look and I think, oh my God, you know, if they knew just a little bit of what, what we offer, just a little bit, just if they even knew that the head and the pelvis are connected, how much trouble it would save them. So think you know thank god i have you because otherwise i'd be by myself again like moshe and mia yeah it's it's it never became thank god i have other things i can share with people right but this this element of of the beliefs and so on there's just a few of us that really see it and and we want to share it i hope that answered your question So my father and all his family are golfers and there was no golf course in Israel. So they decided a bunch of them to build a golf course, which was a very fancy idea in Israel at the time. And it's still there. It's beautiful. It's in a place called Caesarea, which was a town, an ancient 2000 year old place of Julius Caesar or something, which was all crumbling. But I mean, the whole area is really beautiful. So anyway, they built this golf course. And so we used to go there a lot with Moshe because they had a good restaurant and he'd just sit there and watch all the golfers and he'd sit there and go, okay, you guys, you just keep playing. The way you're playing, you'll all come to me in the end. (laughs) That's a little story. You can stop the recording unless you... So I'd go with my mom to um, to where they used to give private lessons. So of course there were no like Feldenkrais beds. <laughs> there were just some simple wooden things with with straw mattresses on them. And he had they were side by side working. You take two patients at a time, and I could wander in and out. He had his brother, who was a very nice man. He had a publishing book publishing company which was in the basement of that house and then they had their living quarters and his mother's 
um, the apartments and they had a cook. And uh, so every time I'd come there, she'd be cooking lunch or something like that. And his mother was this really skinny, little white hair. She had this white, amazing hair she had on, you know, and her hair. And she was a, decided at the age of 70 or something that she wants to be a painter. So she wasn't a great painter, but her paintings were everywhere, like these big flowers in different colors, and they were all over the place. And she'd be sitting there painting and uh, criticizing everybody. <laughs> and, you know, at the beginning, she was really mad at my mother. She thought that she, she, what is she and Moshe doing in that room downstairs? She'd go and spy on them in case they're doing terrible things. <laughs> And I, I, I know this uh, story that my mother tells when she came the first or second time she was there, she was waiting for Moshe, my mom. Um, and his mother was sewing. Did she tell you the story? She was there doing needlepoint or something like that. And then she started going like this all over. She was on her bed, looking, looking, looking. And she goes, I, I lost my needle. I lost my needle. You've got good eyes. Come and help me find my needle. Help me find my needle. I lost it. So my mom comes and looks a little bit around. She goes, I don't know, I can't find it. Maybe, maybe you'll find it tomorrow, you know, on the floor. She goes, if I would have said tomorrow, I would have still been a virgin. <laughs> it's a woman of 80 something. And you see where Moshe gets this, you know, he's not afraid of saying any words. And again, you see how it goes back. Oh, Giuliano, I have to send you these songs, these French songs by, you know, that are so down to earth about real people and a little body and anti disestablishment and you know we had these songs in the house all the time we had a gramophone that was you know one of these boxes it was about this size i still remember it with like a basket weave on it and this big turntable and this needle you put on and we had tons of records and the French influence was really big. And it was partly because Moshe had spent his, 20, you know, the, the 1920s and 30s in Paris, which was so vibrant at the time. So such a bed of, um, for artists and, uh, you know, avant-garde. So this, this singer was part of that. He used to sing in nightclubs in France, this, this man, Georges Barsens. Um, and I will, I think that we should add some of his music to, to some of these podcasts because with translation, because the words are really important, very, very strong social uh, commentary with humor. So we had a lot of French in the house as well. My grandfather, my grandmother spoke French as well. So I just, I just want to just add here what a big influence France was on Moshe, because people don't know if they know that a lot. French culture. Okay. This is the music. Okay, so in terms of music, so I, I always like the classics and I'm actually very conventional. I'm very mainstream compared to Moshe and my mother who were a little bit bohemian. <laughs> and um, so I, I studied classical music and in, in our, one of our neighbors was a very a pretty famous pianist uh, at the time, world famous. He used to come and practice on my piano. My grandmother sent a piano from England for me. Uh, we didn't have any then in Israel, I think. She sent me a baby grand and I, 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 I played a lot. And one of my, my favorite aunt was a concert pianist. So that was not so much connected with Moshe, but connected with my friendship with the London Symphony Orchestra, who used to play when they'd come to Israel, they would organize musical evenings, they'd play quartets in our home. And Giuliano, uh, then when they came to Japan, I also arranged for them to play quartets at Noguchi's parties. So we'd go there with our friends and then he'd work on us. He, he actually did, did his work on me and on, on the Okura family, the, our, our actor friends and on the musicians. He showed us what he does. I remember him still saying, uh, certain things about us um, and, and Noguchi did. Um, and then in terms of the sports and things, well, you know, I was not allowed to do ballet. When I wanted to do ballet, which every little girl wants to do, um, he was very against it. And so he'd stand in the middle of the living room and you know how he was a little bit like a hippopotamus and he'd go like this 
And like that, he said, look how ridiculous these movements are. Look how stupid these movements are. And he'd be mimicking a ballerina to get me to not want it. And they forced me to go and learn modern dance. But then it had to be judo. And so I was pretty much coerced. The thing is that because of the way he brought us up and the awareness that we had, I was good at any sport I tried. I was good at running. I was good at jumping. I was very athletic because it was so easy to get good at things. Um, so when I started to do the judo, um, as I said, we bought, we imported tatamis from Japan. There were no dojos in the country at all. And we had the first dojo where our garage used to be, became a dojo. And people, the first uh, man who did uh, ninjitsu in the West, uh, Don, who started it in Japan, uh, he was teaching there. Um, Krav Maga, uh, Dennis Hanover was teaching in our dojo. Uh, but the first Moshe and us, we used to do it in the garden. We had a very big lawn and he'd be doing judo with us on the lawn. So I was, I was kind of forced to do judo. I mean, not that I was crying or anything, but I, you know, I would have preferred to do ballet. So that definitely was something that would not have happened if not for Moshe. And that's okay, because I used it later. I mean, I was 20, no, 18. Yeah, Moshe was in the house again. I went for a walk on the beach. It was stormy. I used to like to walk in the storm, you know, with the wind. Um, and I was just coming up the cliffs to my house, and this guy came behind me and pinned me to the, to the rocks. And, you know, I you know, kiss me, just a little kiss or something. This is a funny thing. And I'm like, no, go away. He goes, why not? I'm Jewish too. <laughs> it was just so stupid. And so I threw him over, right? I just got rid of him. And I went home. And uh, remember, Moshe was there. I told them. I said, this guy just tried to attack me. I'm glad I could throw him over. So it was useful. It gave me confidence. And it also until now, actually, my peripheral vision. He, oh, of course, he used to tell me. I've got to get Mia on in a minute. He used to tell me. That's OK. We can talk about that maybe sometime we'd sit outside in a cafe or something in Tel Aviv and he'd say, look at this person and the way he's walking or standing. I, I think I gave that drill in the class too. I said, I say sometimes, look at the person that looks to you with the most, most standing out unusual posture and get yourself in that posture and you'll know what they feel. Because when you stand in a certain way, as we know, right? I've made it much more explicit in the way I've written it and we teach it. But we know now, but that's why he got so interested afterwards in NLP. I got him into the NLP and he gave them a talk. Let's leave that for next time because it's a lot of stories there with the NLP connection and also um, how he taught me to see postures and know what people think and get into these postures to get to, look, to develop empathy and understanding and ask myself, why, how does this happen? that this person has worked themselves into this position and this way of walking. You know, listen to the steps, look at the posture. Are they breathing? What's different? Looking for differences and learning from it. Um, and I think that it is so important that, that things don't get embalmed and saved as, as a Bible from, you know, we need to update them. So it was before we knew about NLP, which helped a lot, before we had the fMRIs. So that's why I am enabled to write and code this because we have, you know, tools, we have proof of it. Um, but he was interested in all these things. Like how is the body and the thinking connected? That's why then he goes, spirits, what? That's like way out there, I'm not going. <laughs> Okay, so we can go into this um, subject a little bit.